everybody loves a clone. Whether it's clone armies, evil twins, or stolen identities, popular culture is obsessed with clones and the idea of someone who thinks and is exactly like you. But in biology, it's a lot harder to be a clone. Genetically speaking, I am a clone. I have an identical twin sister, so our DNA is exactly the same, down to the last base pair. But even identical twins are not exactly identical. So for example, the whole rationale of something like the Human Genome Project is the idea that when you know the gene sequence that's present in an individual, you know everything you need to about that individual's biology. And of course that's totally wrong um, because it doesn't matter what's present. Most of what's present is junk. What matters is how those genes interact with the cellular environment and the external environment and things like how old the organism is and its own developmental past and what it ate that day and a whole bunch of factors. Yeah. In 2005, a study of more than 40 sets of twins revealed that there are differences in the expression of their DNA. More importantly, the differences increase with age and with different life experiences. The chromosomes on the left are from a pair of three-year-old twins, and on the right from a pair of 50-year-old twins, with differences highlighted in red and green. But how are these differences achieved when the twins' DNA stays exactly the same? The question turns out to be very complicated, and it has sparked a fairly recent field of study, epigenetics. I think the important realization that epigenetics comes from is the realization that, um, that, gene, that the presence of certain gene sequences is not what's important. What's important is how those genes work, what turns them on and off. And that's a, that's a real, that's a real um, paradigm shift. Epigenetics doesn't just apply on an individual level. In fact, it may be more useful in understanding cell differentiation. All the cells in your body are basically twins of each other, but they can perform vastly different functions due to epigenetic control. For example, a single blood stem cell can differentiate into a variety of shapes and purposes, from hunting down bacteria to carrying oxygen. So the question is, here's a cell with a gene over here, and here's a cell with a gene over here, and somehow they have to, these cells are going to establish different gene expression patterns. If the DNA sequences are identical, it's somehow you can, you're going to be able to make a muscle cell here, and over here maybe a nerve cell, and this gene's got to be off here and on here, and how do you do that? The Holmes Lab at Wesleyan University studies the basic mechanisms of epigenetics. We're focused on this, this these silencing problems. So silencing was, was this term for shutting a gene off. That's exactly what it sounds like. When DNA is silenced, the strand of DNA wraps tightly around a nucleosome, a disc-like protein structure made up of four pairs of histone proteins. Like spools of thread, the nucleosomes can be coiled around each other to any degree of compactness, allowing the cell to control what genes are expressed. Where the action really is, is changing these nucleosomes. So you can get these nucleosomes on the DNA to kind of be on their own and apart from each other. You can make little modifications that make them attract each other and kind of make that armor maybe. And they did a fascinating experiment in which they took two, two mothers, again these mothers should be basically identical genetic level, and they gave them different diets. Uh, and one thing they pushed on, one, one population of these mothers was things with lots of methyl groups. So methyl, uh, a methyl group is a very simple chemical group that can modify DNA. In this case it can also get added to histones and form these structures. But when you just changed this mother's diet, they produced a litter of pups, again, that had different characteristics than the mothers without the methyl group. So these, this litter of pups has identical genetic information. Very subtle, really, change in the diet could lead to uh, an alteration in the gene expression patterns that cause big changes, big differences in the adult appearance of, and behavior of these pups. So it's not all in the DNA sequence. So it's not nature versus nurture, it's, it's nature and nurture. It's, it's the the intersection of the genetics with the environment that's going to be where all the interesting kind of behavioral things are going to be coming out. We have reached what has been called the midlife crisis of the DNA molecule after 50 years, and we're starting to, to think harder, in my view, about what genes mean and what they don't mean. And ultimately, I think that will get us to a much better understanding of diversity among human beings as well as other kinds of diversity.